Okay, hello everybody. We go to our next presentation. It's John and Jason. John Carlson and Jason Wright. They'll be talking about their uh, uh, the C128VG adapter from John Carlson and the CGA to RGB adapter from Jason Wright. And Jason came all the way from the United Kingdom. Uh, he's all the way here, all the way from England. Uh, take it away, guys. Okay. Uh, well, this. I created this little design off of uh, uh, basically taking Richard uh, Gonikin's circuit and uh, used surface mount components to try and shrink it down a little bit, make it uh, a bit of a nicer package. So this will actually plug right into the back of a C128 or 128D, uh, hangs right off the, uh, the RGBI port, and I uh, designed it to work with the, uh, the Gonbez GBS8220. So, um, yeah, it can feed basically CGA into this board and get VGA out. And the Gonbez, they supply a, a couple of cables with each board that, uh, that have just tin wires at the end. And so I, I created just a, um, a footprint for this, this terminal block. You take the, the wire that comes with it, shove, shove it in there into the terminal block, and you get the analog CGA out. It feeds right into the board. Um, you have to buy a, a separate... Uh, power supply brick for the, the GBS 8220, and uh, this will supply 5 volt power to this board and then allow you to get the, uh, the analog in. And uh, that's uh, an example of one feeding, a, feeding this GBS here right onto the screen. So you've got pr pretty good color matching. To try and get the colors as accurate as possible, I, I actually borrowed a, a couple of Commodore monitors and hooked up the, uh, the RGBI digital out into those monitors and, uh, and um, just me measured the signals for each one of the, the situations. At, at one point I made a little test adapter so I could um, incite the uh, RGB and the I lines independently to, to actually measure all the voltages that are being generated and try to match that as exactly as possible. And so there, there's probably going to be a, a little bit of uh, 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 color variance coming from the, the Gondes board and, and from this particular monitor. So I'm, I'm very critical of, of my work here. I see, yeah, the, the brown on this monitor it looks a little bit light. The orange look, looks a little bit light, a little bit more like, like salmon, depending on uh, what your viewing angle is. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to announce I, I finally got some built up. Um, I'm selling them at the show. If you're interested in, in buying one, um, you know, hand me $40 cash. I'll, I'll, Hand you one of these boards. Um, you know, I can even demonstrate it working here for you before you go home with it. And make sure you know, make sure you're, it's working and you're happy with it. Um, after the show, I'll probably sell them online on the website. Uh, yeah, uh, I've got a little website here on the board. It says bit-c128.com. So it's a it's a bitc128 video adapter. Thank you very much, Jason. Take it away. Okay, um, essentially the same product, it takes the CGA digital output from the 12880 column, converts it into an RGB signal. However, I took a slightly different tack and designed it to be a standalone board to feed the SCART inputs the European televisions have. So, two connectors for the 128, direct to the 9 pin CGA, but also a VIC connector, because that supplies 5 volts for the board. Also carried through the fire, the um, the audio and the chrominance luminance signals from the VIC to allow for switch of output. The output has just a simple analog RGB, but also a switchable positive or negative sync, depending on if you want to use one of these boards or a European SCART signal with these different sync signal. Um, I've connected an Amiga video connector on just for ease of connecting to analog monitors, but that essentially is just a slightly different tack version of on the same board. Um, instead of the terminal block and onboard connectors, I've gone with pin headers and DuPont connectors, so you make up whichever cables are needed with whatever lengths, or even internally mount this in the 128 for a smaller system. All surface mount again. And I have to say, I didn't take a monitor apart, I didn't measure the values, I guessed. <laughs> and I got exceedingly close, so... <laughs> Not quite the colour accuracy Don has, but he's good. 
I think your brow's a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> the, the brown was an incredible difficult fix for both of us because it requires special case logic on one color. Um, most of the um, adapters you see online use simple passive diodes, resistors. They do not work with brown, you get dark yellow. That's not how CDA is meant to be displayed. So you have to have an active board such as this or this to get yeah, around. And I should point out, that this is also not the IBM CGA. This no. Is, this is Commodore CGA, which, which has slightly different colors. Slightly different, but it is exceedingly close. I believe they changed the pinout by one as well on the connector to add the monochrome. Bill added the monochrome um, I think so, output. Yeah. CGA um, comes out, but. And that's both the boards. Yeah, that's both the boards. Now, uh, yeah, I also have uh, another little project that I'm working on. I feel like I really lucked out on, on this one earlier this year. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, I'm, I'm designing a new cartridge-based game console uh, that's based around um, a fairly large FPGA, a, a uh, an Altera Cyclone 5 part with 49,000 logic elements, so we, we can conceivably fit in an, an, you know, an entire Amiga um, right into the FPGA, and this is a standalone product. Um, fortunately, the guy that is really behind the, the product, he, uh, he managed to buy the tooling and the rights to use the mechanical design for, uh, for this old system. Uh, it, yeah, and uh, yeah, n never mind this, this is a little, little test sample here. Um, so back around 1994, Atari had this wonderful system that, uh, that Leonard Tremiel helped get out the door called the Atari Jaguar. And, uh, and so we, we now own the mechanical design for the Jaguar. Um, I'm designing this, this new guts. We, we are gonna have USB-based controllers plus uh, two uh, D9 connectors in the front, and uh, I've, I've designed a really um, robust circuit for the D9 controllers. So if you can find any controller that's got that, that D9 that will mate to the, the mail pins on this side, it'll work with this system. So uh, you can see more about that on our website at retrovgs.com. Any questions for uh, John and Jason? On, on the game system, um, well, we're about to uh, about to do crowdfunding, probably through Kickstarter um, within the next few weeks. Um, and uh, that depends on our volume. We've got a lot of R&D costs that we've that we've got to amortize. Um, if we can get decent volume, we can get it down to about $400. Yeah, so it's, it's a pretty substantial system. So we packed a lot of guts in the box. Uh, how much memory is on it? Oh, what, on the? Uh, how much RAM do you have connected to the FPGA? To, uh, FPGA. Uh, oh, um, on the FPGA? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> let me try and remember that. It's about three quarters of a gigabyte attached to the FPGA. And, and I, I say about, it's actually a little bit more um, because there are actually three banks of RAM attached to the FPGA, allowing us to do various different functions. There's uh, one megabyte of SRAM that we use mostly as just a DMA buffer. So we can, we can use the FPGA to automatically get a lot of the information off of the cartridge. And we're looking at some, some fairly substantial cartridge sizes on there as well. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the mandates on, on our design is that we have to make this for, for this really hard use case in which we basically play with the system and shove it in a closet for 50 years and it still has to work when you pull it out of the closet. And, and so we can't use a lot of the cheap commodity uh, flash memories because those are good for you know, maybe five years, 10 years, 20 years. Um, we're using this premium flash memory that's got a, a thick, uh, thick oxide tunnel window and that's rated for 100 year data retention. Um, and, any other questions? Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, yes and no. Uh, there's, of course, the exposed cartridge bus. Um, I'm trying to make that as, uh, as open and freely accessible as possible. Um, right now, I'm 
pushing to have the uh, the FPGA board, well, the FPGA on a separate board that will attach with a couple of connectors. So if, if you wanted to stick something on that bus, you just pop it between the FPGA board and the main board. You know what, do you have uh, an idea for something you want to expand in there? Uh, no, I'm just creating the competition too. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, so yeah, um, I'd be really interested to talk to you about your project too, see what your competition say. <laughs> Uh, Jason, what is the the pricing on your board? Um, I'm selling these for about thirty dollars, but that's um, without the connectors because they had quite a substantial cost. So the base board, there, which is thirty dollars. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, yeah, this uh, I've got a few units for sale here at the show, forty dollars um, online later for fifty dollars. <coughs> Any other questions for John and Jason? Uh, for your game? Uh, for the game unit? RetroVGS.com. It's a retro video game system. Okay. Uh, Jason, do you have a, an email or a website uh, for your item? I do. It's www.pyrophusprojects.com. P Y R O F E R, the Pyrophus. Um, the board isn't currently for sale on that website, but you can contact me through the site if you're interested. Any other questions for the gentlemen? Okay, thank you guys. Right, thank you.